Hey there, welcome to my latest podcast. I am so excited about having Les Carter, Dr. Carter, back. I was incredibly grateful and gosh, I had a lot of fun the last time you and I talked. Was it for your podcast or YouTube video? Yeah, well, I think we did it on the podcast, and and Ross, you know, I've I've known of your work, and and uh, of course, you know, when you're on YouTube, you kind of check each other out, so that's what oh, we sure. did, and uh, it's like that's why I wanted you on my podcast because I so appreciate the work you do. Yeah, it's it's actually uh, kind of cool. So for the listeners and or viewers, we had a conversation before we decided to press record, but we were talking about how we are working to help this larger community to grow, to heal, to understand, and how our approach is different from a lot of people's approaches. And so that, I think, is what has gotten my attention about your work. Uh, before we jump into the topic, Les, how long have you been on YouTube? Uh, did you discover I, this? I began the summer of uh, 2018. You know, and when it started talking about surviving narcissism, frankly, it was just it, it's just become more and more prominent. And it's uh, when you use that word narcissism, virtually everyone who hears it will say, oh yeah, I know somebody yeah. in my world, or I have a leader that uh, in a group that I'm in, or then we look at politics or we look at other kind of circumstances. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> and, and so I just began to talk on a real common sense basis about that. And it resonated. And it just kind of took off and and uh, went from there, and and so I'm I'm going to keep speaking into the topic until I run out of things to say, which uh, may <laughs> probably, may be a probably while. never. Yeah, it's it's interesting because when I started the whole YouTube thing eleven years ago, when my first edition of my Human Magnet Syndrome was put out, I wanted to talk about what I do. I'm a psychotherapist. I like to help people heal and overcome the problem that they have that draws them into these relations with narcissists. And I noticed that all of the videos that I did on narcissists, and this is 10, 11 years ago, they got exponentially more views than yep. the videos where I tell people what to do and not to do. And so for me, it has been this kind of yin and yang pull because I love talking about the problem, as you and I will be doing uh, today, but I also love talking about how to solve it. So when I ran across your work, I realized you are, you're the real thing, and I hope that you keep doing it until the very last day of your life. I know. Let's give you, let's give you at least a year break. <laughs> <laughs> love a little reprieve. I have a father who's still alive in 94. I don't know if I'll go to 94. <laughs> So, so do you want to introduce the topic that we were that we're planning on talking about? Well, you know, you and I were talking about how uh, this this whole thing about understanding narcissism can become so difficult when you're, let's say, in a post divorce situation, yeah. and you're trying to figure out how to uh, to to parent kids right in such a way that they're not going to be damaged. But then I, I've had so many cases where one parent. Uh, it really wants to be fair and, uh, you know, have have the proper kind of teaching and boundaries and and all like that. And the other just will sabotage it. Yeah. And and basically they uh, that that uh, less than healthy parent can bring all of the difficulty that uh, contributed to the downfall of the marriage and bring it into the uh, the co-parenting uh, arena and it's it's really difficult, and frankly, the greater amount of work to help smooth it out is going to be on the shoulders of the more healthy person, exactly. even though the unhealthy person is the one that really needs to do the work. And it, it's it's not at all an easy task. No, and and it's actually perhaps the most difficult task that the recovering codependent, or what I call an SLD or self love deficient. I want to change the word codependency to self love deficit disorder. But whether I do or not, I'm going to stick with my terms. But it is. Well, I, I, I think you're spot on with that. Self-love deficiency. Absolutely. I Thank you. I think so. This way we call it the name that it is and not some antiquated term that comes from uh, some ancient understanding of alcoholism and a partner of alcoholism. I have from the very beginning understood the interaction of the needs of the narcissist, um, although pathological and the needs of a recovering SLD when they break up. In fact, 
I just submitted an article, which is really part of my new upcoming book, where it says the 15 strategies narcissists do when ending a relationship. And so let's share what we know so we can help others either prepare, which is my approach, my strategy, if, I, if I'm given an opportunity, or survive. Let's first talk about the terms, parental alienation. Let's kind of define that and the other terms that you and I talked about. So why don't you start that off there? And, and I'll, I'll chime in. Well, and by the way, um, there's uh, there are a couple of books uh, that would be very interesting for people. One is called Divorce Poison. And then, um, and that's a gold standard book. And then another one is uh, Judith Wallerstein, uh, Second Chances. And uh, she did like 25 years of follow-up study with children of divorce. Right. And uh, one of the things that they found is that uh, you can have a certain percentage of parents who are post-divorce who make it their task to train the children to hate the other parent in the same way they do. Now they won't say it like that, but that's the, the net result. And yeah, you know, for example, I, I've had cases where let's suppose you have a 13 year old child that's visiting dad right. and then dad gives that child a gift. And so the child goes back to mom's house and um, the gift is um, you know, confiscated. Right. It's like, we don't need that here. Or you already have one of those. And little things like that, or uh, these days, uh, you know, things like uh, having a cell phone or how much time you spend on the computer. And uh, there's there's no effort whatsoever to coordinate. It's like, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the way it's supposed to be. And if that other parent won't coordinate with me, then they're an idiot and you need to uh, you need to know how terrible they are. And and, and it's it's uh, terribly devastating because the only person in that equation that's really going to be damaged is, is not mom and it's not dad. It's going to be the kid. Yeah. But narcissists, uh, I, I, when you talk about having self-love deficiency, I yeah. actually have um, have spoken about narcissism as being the absence of love. Interesting. And uh, th that's that, that's a succinct um, definition that I have. Or another is narcissism can be defined as the uh, the loss of integrity. Interesting. And uh, it can play out in uh, the the way we parent. And so many times, rather than mom and dad uh, saying, okay, our marriage didn't work out, I understand. And, and by the way, there are times when it, it's reasonable to go ahead and get a divorce, not because divorce is wonderful, but sometimes marriages can be dysfunctional enough to where we don't need to to, to perpetuate it. Uh, I think we need to be judicious. But, you know, uh, mom and dad at that point would need to say, uh, why don't we uh, at, at the very least, uh, as we split, let's make this as um, as uh, beneficial to the kid as we possibly can. And uh, even mm -hmm. though we may differ, let's show honor and regard toward yeah. the other parent to the child because that's going to benefit the child. And uh, they're, they're actually, I mean, Judith Wallerstein actually shows that when you do that, uh, then uh, you can have good results. Perhaps about a third of them, uh, based on her research, are going to be damaged because the parents just simply can't go that path. There's so many things you said that are so important. First, the term parental alienation. To understand it, you have to understand the, the inner workings of a narcissist. You know, as as we know, they have a personality disorder. So when there is a divorce. There is what I call the supreme mother of all narcissistic injuries. If you stand up to disagree, set a boundary, a narcissist has a narcissistic injury, which is a um, reflexive rage response that requires the narcissist to punish the person, whether they realize it or not. So if the divorce is the mother of all narcissistic injuries and the narcissist is unable to take responsibility vis-a-vis -vis their personality disorder, then they are going to feel righteous and empowered to punish their spouse, their partner. And through this rage and this narcissistic injury, they are going to execute sometimes systemically, sometimes reactively, this plan to punish them. 
And the best way to do that is to claim ownership of the children and to understand why they can destroy the children in the process is because at the core of all pathological narcissists, and my belief is this fury of rage and shame born out of their childhood experiences. So this rage and fury that they're not connecting to is directing them to punish the person that they believe is hurting them to gain ownership of the objects, <laughs> their children. Well, and I'm, I'm tracking with you, Ross. Uh, one of the things that, um, that I, I, a starting point that I have as I try to understand narcissists is they're, they're people in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. uh, just as you said, they, they started out early on in life having to, to gauge, you know, their authorities and peer group. If I say this, am I going to get in trouble? Uh, if, if you find out these things about me, are you going to judge me? And so when we talk about shame and guilt and fear, yeah. it, it all comes from them being exposed at a very um, vulnerable age to a whole lot of conditional acceptance, a lot of that condescension and, uh, and, you know, problems are, are not solved in a clean and logical kind of way. And so they bring the pain that's associated with that into their adult years. And then, like you say, when a divorce happens, they're still in pain and the divorce is a painful situation. And so that's what informs the way that they engage with people. Yes. Uh, whereas uh, when we try to in, uh, help our children, one of the things we want to do is we want to think, wait a minute, I remember what it was like when I was a child. And, uh, and I know that I wanted to be treated with regard and I wanted somebody to say, what do you think? Or at least uh, yeah. give consideration or empathy to what I was feeling. Narcissists, the pain is so strong and their shame and their fear and their dysfunction is just so self-defining that they're not able to go into that space. The child is the one that's going to be uh, the recipient of the, the brainwashing that goes along with all of their internal uh, turmoil. So... The pain that you're talking about, um, I look at it from more of an attachment psychodynamic point of view is that, you know, children, uh, all advanced mammals require safety, nurturing, attention yes. um, in order to develop normally. And a human needs unconditional love, safety, and all that. And if they do, they they become healthy, healthy as they survive and flourish in their life. But the child who is from a narcissistic parent they disappointed that parent, whereas the child who's going to be a future codependent or SLD found a way to get the attention of the narcissist and make the, uh, the narcissist want them to make them feel better. So long story short, the adult narcissist experienced such incredible trauma, neglect, abandonment, abuse, the bad seed, um, they could never make the narcissist happy. And so their experience was so egregiously traumatic that the brain, the mind disassociated it, just like CPTSD or, right. and so they're not aware of what you are talking about. And what, um, you're spot on. They have so much anger and rage and shame, but they cannot get to it because it's disassociated, which is why they have a narcissistic personality disorder. So in these spot divorces on. is that this rage, this anger, is born, from my point of view, out of shame and self-hate that they can never connect to. And so they project it. And you've talked about it. I've talked about projection. They put all of the, the, the self-anger, self-hate onto other people and feel justified. And they'll never know where it comes from. As you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, what you just said, but they can't go into that space with insight um, because it's too, it's it's just not accessible to them. Uh, and, you and it'd use be the too term uh, self-hate. I, I use the term self-loathing. Um, and, and most of them will say, I don't loathe myself. It's exactly. like, yeah, you do. Um, basically, you're so afraid 
of people finding out that you're flawed or you're imperfect. It's like, no, I can't let other people know that about me. I'm so afraid of that. I'm so ashamed of the negative side. But what they'll do is they'll uh, they'll flip it around and say, no, it's not my problem. It's you people out there that are so judgmental. Right. Exactly, and so they they and uh, we we have the term it's projection. They see in you what they can't come to terms with inside themselves, and so that's what we really have going on here. Yeah. And so, if you're the healthy parent, one of the things that you can do is you can think, well, what I need to do is I need to make that narcissistic uh, parent uh, who's now I'm trying to co-parent with. I need to get them to see the light. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah, they are activated. They cannot see the light. First of all, they can never see the light unless the light is um is their light <laughs> or it, it's their yeah. lamp. And so they are so activated. There's abandonment, there's shame, there's self-hatred that they can't access, but all they can do is pour it out on someone else. And that in my point of view explains how someone who actually believes they love their children can destroy their mental health. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Ross, I, I know you could, I, I can give you scores of, of uh, illustrations about oh, how yeah. that plays out. It breaks my heart. And, and then when the, uh, the more healthy, the alienated parent uh, comes to the counseling office and says, how am I going to manage this? Uh, it's like, well, uh, what you can't do is you can't, control someone who who has no insight they're just gonna they're just kind of like the old the proverbial bull in the china shop right uh, so what you can do is when you have your moments of influence you uh you illustrate what healthiness looks like right and sometimes it, it works out other times the uh alienating parent is so quote successful in uh in building that wall yeah. Uh, between uh, yourself and the child that uh, that you're somewhat limited. And that's what makes this such an insidious kind of a situation. When the child thinks, I can't show loyalty to my other parent okay. because this narcissistic parent is going to get mad. And so they, uh, the trail, they wind yeah. up uh, just uh, being guarded around the healthy parent. They wind up making excuses on behalf of the unhealthy parent. And it's like, to, yep. to that child, sweetheart, you don't have to do that. Or son, it's not necessary. But the uh, the narcissistic parent says, no, you you need to show your complete loyalty to me. Uh -huh. And anything beyond that is, is going to bring shame onto you. And that's where you just mentioned they project onto the child and they, they breathe into the child the very thing that uh, took them into the wrong direction. There's all, so many different starting points that a client comes to you who is a, um, a parent and a victim of parental alienation syndrome. One is the healthy parent, which I don't get, which is great because I work on the ones that are codependent or SLD. But the SLD, the codependent, many of them have been gaslit. And very, very succinctly, gaslighting is a systematic strategy to make a person think that something is wrong with them when there wasn't that in the beginning, or it was only in mild proportions. If you believe or understand that narcissists survive in the relationships, um, of course, by manipulation and, and everything that we know about narcissism, but by gaslighting, by making people believe things that aren't true. And that is an essential concept to understand if there is a child who has a really good, solid attachment to the SLD parent, and the narcissistic parent starts to try to gaslight them or demean or, or alienate them, it's a different scenario versus what I see as the more typical type of child who has never gotten the love, respect, and caring from this narcissistic parent who all of a sudden claims that they do and wants to and the other one doesn't. If they have been around gaslighting, if they have been gaslit, it means their reality has already shifted towards the type of thinking of the narcissist. And right. these are the ones that grow up and come see us. And so these children are even more susceptible to it. And let's say one of our clients breaks through this and gets help from you, me, or someone else on gaslighting and self-love deficit disorder and cites a divorce that person. 
the children are more susceptible to the gaslighting, um, the parental alienation, which is manipulation, lying, triangulation, everything that um, we can talk about later. And that's the point I, I, that I think is important to explain that this is not as simple as what the narcissist is doing in order to hurt the partner because of the narcissistic injury, but they've already more than likely started a campaign of gaslighting and these children are already susceptible. But uh, what do you think of the connection of parental alienation and gaslighting? What are your thoughts about that? Uh, well, I, I think you're spot on. My definition of it is, is uh, incredibly parallel with what yours is. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, the uh, it's in the, I, I hate to put it this way, the vested interest of the narcissist because they, of course, they yeah. must yeah. be in control. They must be in the superior position. It's in their vested interest to get the child to uh, doubt anything other than what that narcissist says. And so it, they just kind of do it like first nature. Uh, exactly. For example, if um, uh, let, let's say a uh, uh, the mother who has alienated the father uh, is ju just wants that child to, to to hate the father, and then if the child says, "Well, uh, Dad and I went and did such and such, and we had a really good time, and we met some of his friends, and, and uh, I met some other uh, kids, and it, it really went well." Mom, rather than saying, wow, that was really good. Well, tell me about, you know, what, you yeah. know, how your dad reacted and uh, what was it like? Who were the friends and what did you do? Uh, that would be healthy. Yeah. Uh, that narcissistic parent, it's like, well, uh, I, I don't have any idea who those people are. Uh, well, 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 and they, they're they're going to have a narcissistic injury and feel like they're threatened. Therefore, take the position you're yeah. talking about. And so somehow they have to diminish it. Yes. Now th that's one little bitty small illustration, but then take that and um, and multiply it by literally a thousand. Uh, hmm. There can be uh, repetitive comments to that effect, and so finally the the kid thinks, well, you know, mom seems to get mad every time I say something positive right. about dad, or it could be the the opposite. By the way, I'm not um, picking one over the other. Uh, and so I've got to be more guarded myself then. Yeah. And so the child learns the shame and uh, learns to to filter uh, who they are and what they think through the uh, through the unhealthy parent. A quick story. I remember when I was eight years old, and I can it's a trauma, so I can remember almost everything. Um, my parents talked about divorce, and they brought us right in the middle. My dad did, of course, the narcissist, and he says, "Which one? Who do you want to live with?" And it makes sense. And then the kids <laughs> thinking, oh. <laughs> yeah, what the f And there was a litmus test at that point. The, the child who was going to be an adult codependent said, which was me, I felt sorry. For, I wanted to live with my dad because I always wanted to get the love I couldn't get, but I felt sorry for my mom. So I said, mom. And the other three kids said, dad. Actually, my brother wasn't, my, wasn't born yet. So if we look at the children in future tense, I was on a track, of course, I didn't know, of being and developing developmentally into an SLD or codependent. And some of my siblings, they were on the track of being a narcissist. So these children already have a personality type that makes them vulnerable to parental alienation, which is why in a, in a family of, say, three, four, or whatever, not all kids get sucked into it. But the children who have never been the good child, uh, the, the, the preferred child, the, the trophy child, they are the ones that are most susceptible to parental alienation. And if we fast forward to them as an adult, they then are going to replicate the next generation. They're going to probably be the next um, narcissist. Well. And just like their parent, that narcissistic yeah. parent probably was in their earlier years, and it just becomes a generational pattern. You're exactly right.